And I, I would um, I would say certainly we are a hundred percent. We are a nation of explorers. We're also a nation of that leads, and um, this of course represents us returning. American astronauts um, to space on American rockets from American soil. So this is a great opportunity for us to once again lead. And this time when we lead, we're doing it differently than we've ever done it before. Uh, NASA is going to be a customer. We're going to be one customer of many customers, and we want Elon to have lots of customers. Um, but, uh, but we also want to have numerous providers. Uh, we need dissimilar redundancy. You guys have heard me say this. I'm going to keep saying it. Um, we've had days in this country where we lost a space shuttle and our space program was down for a period of years at a time. We need to make sure that we have redundancy in a way that, that, that doesn't happen again. And of course, if we look at what we've done with commercial resupply to the International Space Station, there's a perfect example of how sometimes when there is a setback, uh, we can continue to move forward because we have other solution sets to accomplish the objectives. So um, all of this is important for a very specific reason. We're on the cusp of commercializing low Earth orbit. I want to see large amounts of capital flowing into activities that include humans in space. Um, and those activities could be industrialized biomedicine, it could be advanced materials, and it could be uh, people that, that want to go to space for tourism, tourism pr purposes. But, but I will tell you this, there is a future where space is commercialized. And I also want to be clear that NASA will always have a presence in low Earth orbit. We are not, we are not there's a lot, of, a lot left to learn. We are only on, on the, the beginning of what we're going to learn. So um, what does that mean? That means NASA is, is going to be a customer. Uh, we just want to make sure there are customers that are not just NASA. That drives down our costs. It increases our access. And it's not just for us, but for the entire world and for the private sector as well. Hello there, everyone. I'm Errol Bonnet in Washington. And I'm Meg Oliver in New York. We're breaking away from Kevin McCarthy's news conference for the launch of the latest Soyuz rocket. The rocket will deliver three cosmonauts to the International Space Station from a spaceport in southern Kazakhstan. This marks Russia's first space launch since it invaded Ukraine. Which is really what makes this moment so remarkable. Russia's space agency cut ties with its U.S. and European partners some two weeks ago. That followed a string of economic sanctions imposed on Russia because of the ongoing war. Now, despite the rising tensions between nations, NASA insists operations with the ISS are continuing as normal. CBS News senior space analyst Bill Hardwood uh, joins us now to talk about this and watch it as it happens live, as it unfolds. Bill, thanks so much for, for being with us. I, I just referenced the war, the sanctions. We've got frayed relations. I'm just wondering what's going through your mind as we wait for this, for this launch? Do we really expect this to be typical? Uh, yes, we do for right now. And one thing, I'll, I'll go back to what you said at the opening. They have severed their relations on a commercial basis with companies in the West, they have not severed relations with NASA over the International Space Station. So far, the space station is continuing to operate normally. Both sides work together on a daily basis. There are astronauts in Moscow. Uh, there are Russian cosmonauts in training for space station operations in the U.S. That's still continuing, uh, but you're right. The tensions are higher than I think they've ever been in the space station project. And at any moment, uh, we don't know for sure what's going to happen. All we know for sure right now is Russia is continuing to honor its commitments. NASA is continuing to operate the station. And this launch today, coming up in about two minutes, uh, is, an, is evidence of that. So, you know, hopefully it'll keep going like this while they work out their differences. But as you alluded to, we can't ignore the issues, Bill. The International Space Station has long been one of the biggest signs of U.S. and Russian cooperation. NASA says the ISS Absolutely. is operating as normal, despite the space agencies no longer working together here on Earth. Bill, you've been covering this for such a long time. How does that work? You know, the Russians provide the propulsion needed to keep the station in orbit. And that's part of the design. Uh, NASA provides the electrical power and big gyroscopes that maintain the station's orientation without needing fuel. Neither side can operate the station by themselves. Uh, cooperation is absolutely critical. And, and again, let me reiterate, uh, NASA and the Russians are still cooperating at this point on the International Space Station. Russia has severed all of its commercial ties uh, with companies in the West, but that's a different, uh, a different situation than the, than the space station. So for now, uh, it's going okay. I, I'll say this. I think that 
uh, things have gotten tense enough now where I think it's going to take some luck and some real diplomacy to keep the station on track and to keep the partnership together. It's certainly at uh, one of its, its lowest points uh, that I can remember. And I think we've got less than a minute until launch here. Bill, we know that a NASA astronaut is scheduled to return to Earth at the end of the month, along with two Russian cosmonauts aboard the Soyuz rocket. As you mentioned, it's commercial ties that have been separated, not what's happening on the ISS. But is any of this in jeopardy at all, considering the war is still unfolding in unpredictable ways? Not that we know of. Uh, Mark Vandehei, the astronaut you refer to, has been on the station. He will have been on the station by 355 days. That's a U.S. record when he finally comes home at the end of this month. The Russians have said, rest assured, we are bringing him home as planned. And NASA says that's going to happen. So everybody's looking forward to Vandehei getting home safe and sound. And as we continue to count down here, Bill, actually, here we go. So let's, let's listen in. Engines, turbo pumps at flight speed. Engines at maximum thrust and lift off. Yeah. Lift off of the Soyuz MS-21. Oh, so let's work in space together. All the parameters of the launch vehicle are nominal. Copy, everything is well on board. And the 30 seconds into flight, everything going as planned. At this second, the International Space Station is flying directly the over the Baikonur the Cosmodrome. One minute into today's flight, continuing to hear good calls. Velocity is over 1,100 miles per hour. Copy everything is good on board. The crew is feeling well. The thrusters of the uh, first and second stage are firing uh, nominally. Uh, everything is stable. Copy. We have just witnessed another spectacular and successful launch, Bill. I know this never gets old for you. What happens now? Well, we just saw the four strap-on boosters separate. The launch is still proceeding. It takes about 8 minutes and 45 seconds for the Soyuz spacecraft to reach orbit. But once it gets there, it'll set off on a two-orbit rendezvous. So this afternoon, the Soyuz, if all goes well, will dock at a newly arrived module on the International Space Station. And these three astro uh, cosmonauts, I should say, will be welcomed aboard. Obviously, they're going up to replace uh, two cosmonauts and astronaut Mark Vandehe. So they will take their place. Vandehe and his crewmates then will board a different Soyuz and return to Earth on March the 30th to wrap up what for him will be a record 355-day mission. So, so far, so good. It's still going, but so far, so good. <laughs> And it really is fascinating to watch this happen in, in real time. Um, once the cosmonauts dock, they're going to join other Russian cosmonauts there, as well as uh, NASA and ESA astronauts on the ISS. Do you see business playing out as usual because these are all scientific experiments taking place completely divided from politics? I mean, is that, is that really um, what you see happening? You know, I've spoken to astronauts about this sort of thing in the past, and they say that the working relationship among astronauts and cosmonauts and among engineers on the ground uh, is very good. They're friends. Uh, they know each other's families, things like that. They don't really discuss or debate politics, or at least not at any public level uh, on the space station. So I think from their perspective, it's pretty much normal operation. You know, anybody who's watched the NASA mission knows 
that you know virtually every minute is scripted out. We're doing lots of experiments and research. There's not a lot of idle time on their hands. Uh, and I think they're focused on their work. The real concern is among the, the managers and planners on Earth who have to come up with contingency plans. What would we do if the Russians did pull out of the station project? Would there be any way for NASA to fill in the gap, come up with their own way to keep the station in orbit without the Russians? You know they must be working on that in the background, but we haven't heard any details. And, and, as, you, and as we were talking about the astronauts and cosmonauts, they seem to get along just fine. All right, Bill Harwood, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. I would um, I would say certainly we are a hundred percent we are a nation of explorers we're also a nation of that leads and um, this of course represents us returning American astronauts um, to space on American rockets from American soil so this is a great opportunity for us to once again lead and this time when we lead we're doing it differently than we've ever done it before uh, NASA is going to be a customer we're going to be one customer of many customers and we want Elon to have lots of customers um, but, uh, but we also want to have numerous providers. Uh, we need dissimilar redundancy. You guys have heard me say this. I'm going to keep saying it. Um, we've had days in this country where we lost a space shuttle and our space program was down for a period of years at a time. We need to make sure that we have redundancy in a way that, that, that doesn't happen again. And of course, if we look at what we've done with commercial resupply to the International Space Station, there's a perfect example of how sometimes when there is a setback, uh, we can continue to move forward because we have other solution sets to accomplish the objectives. So um, all of this is important for a very specific reason. Uh, we're on the cusp of commercializing low Earth orbit. I want to see large amounts of capital flowing into activities that include humans in space. Um, and those activities could be industrialized biomedicine, it could be advanced materials, and it could be uh, people that, that want to go to space for tourism, tourism pr purposes. But, but I will tell you this, there is a future where space is commercialized. 
And I also want to be clear that NASA will always have a presence in low Earth orbit. We are not, we are not there's a lot, of, a lot left to learn. We are only on, on the, the beginning of what we're going to learn. So um, what does that mean? That means NASA is, is going to be a customer. Uh, we just want to make sure there are customers that are not just NASA. That drives down our costs, it increases our access, and it's not just for us, but for the entire world and for the private sector as well.